All right, so welcome to lecture 11 for Computer Science E259. This is Web Services, SOAP, and WSDL Night. So rather than begin with a look back, I thought I'd begin with a bit of motivation tonight. So during my graduate studies, I was working on a research project that required that I, my research was in worm detection and in writing, exploring new techniques for detecting rapid outbreaks of internet worms. Think of these as viruses, but that are self-propagating. And so we wanted to write some software that would run on a distributed network of systems, typical Windows XP machines that we would have really just some friends of mine throughout the country running uh, that was designed to monitor what was going on inside their boxes. Namely, it would hook all of the system calls that were being executed by the Windows uh, XP kernel. But then we wanted to be able to ship that data or summaries thereof to some centralized source so that we could do some kind of uh, real-time analyses and then get a sense of just whether or not these many different systems happen to be infected by some similar threat. So. It, it was hard enough hooking the Windows XP kernel and inserting code into my friend's computers that we wanted to save ourselves time, and we certainly didn't want to reinvent wheels if we didn't have to. And the wheel that we were trying to avoid implementing, what, reinventing, was the shipping of data from my friend's computers to this centralized source. I was going to have to come up with, say, a file format for shipping that data across the wire. I was going to have to write the socket connection calls to handle all of that, make sure that there was some kind of reliability so that if the data got inter uh, interrupted halfway through, what would my program do? Long story short, I didn't want to have to deal with all of that because all I cared about was the research question. Can we detect similarities across these systems? And so quite literally as a result of my having spent so much time in this course over the years, my first instinct was to look at some XML-based solution because I didn't care what the underlying transport mechanism was. I just wanted good libraries. And so I did a bit of Googling for terms like XML RPC, uh, XML SOAP, uh, XML uh, libraries. And long story short, I ended up using a library for Java and a library for C that allowed me to use a protocol called XML RPC, which as the name uh, suggests is an RPC mechanism that it happens to be implemented in XML. And it's a standard that folks have written libraries to support for C, C++, C Sharp, Java, and so forth. And what this meant I was able to do was download from SourceForge or the like a C implementation of this protocol. I was able to just compile it into the C code that was running on my friend's computers. And with just a few pretty well documented function calls, if I wanted to ship an integer or a floating point value or a string from my friend's computer, I literally just call a function that's akin to send string or send float. And then meanwhile, on the centralized server, I just wanted to write this code in Java for various logistical reasons. And so I downloaded the equivalent Java library that implemented the same protocol. And I implemented the equivalent of a listener. And I told that listener to expect some strings, some ints, some floats. And then I asked it to manipulate that data upon receipt of it based on which machine or IP address it was coming from. So long story short, just by doing a bit of Googling, reading up, and downloading of these libraries, I was able to completely avoid having to implement everything that happened between points A and B and focus only on the more interesting stuff on point A, the namely the XP machines and their kernels, and point B, the server who was designed to analyze this data. And frankly, that was for me sort of testament to the, the power of some of these XML-based technologies. Not because the XML is at all interesting. In fact, there's in some inherent inefficiencies to it all, as we've certainly seen. But it's just so darn easy because people have begun adopting these kinds of standards. And one of those very standards we'll look at tonight is one from the W3C called SOAP, which is actually a little more esoteric in syntax than XML RPC and some of these other alternatives. But it's representative of what you can do with some of these off-the-shelf tools, protocols, and, uh, and libraries these days, really just for getting work done without having to worry about some of these lower level details. It was a wonderful experience, um, if only because it was just so darn simple at the end of the day and certainly saved me a lot of time. So with that said, let's take now our quick look back just to uh, set the stage for today. Last time we concluded our look at schema, um, specifically focusing on some types and the nuances thereof. Problem Project 4 does ask you to implement a few schemas, largely to spec out your own data format as well as to uh, adhere to one of our own. Um, but ultimately, um, we don't make heavy use, even in project four, of schemas because the fact of the matter is, because you're implementing both the uh, Scamazon side and the warehouse side and therefore have complete control over your own code, there's certainly no reason to constantly be validating 
code that you yourself are generating, unless you want to jump through that extra hoop. But it's certainly a worth. Uh, it's certainly an exercise we walk you through once, but then we invite you to just turn it off because there's no need to constantly validate your own code. But we did look at some of the features of this language last time. We looked at this notion of a simple type in English. What does it mean if an XML element is of simple type in the context of XML schema? No attributes, no attributes, and and so no child elements. So it's elements as pretty simple as they can get. They can only have textual children. And an attribute, meanwhile, is by nature of simple type. So everything is sort of defined with this limited set of, of descriptors. So then we looked at complex types with a whole bunch of different content models, so to speak, the first of which was a simple content model. So what did it mean if an element was of complex type but simple content? I'm sorry? No mixed, no, mixed, uh, no mixed content. OK, true. And more precisely, it's a, it's a very short step from a simple type to a complex type with simple content. What do you introduce? Attributes. Attributes. So simple content still meant that the content was still pretty simple. We looked at things like the size for a pair of jeans. We looked at uh, things like. Uh, gender or sex, restricting the values thereof to still being text, but we allowed for the possibility of additional attributes or the restriction of certain values. So that too is a feature we were able to employ. It's not just a simple type, but we can actually impose some limits or some constraints on that data. And then finally, we got to the more interesting types, where you can actually have some sort of hierarchies and other additional child elements. And we looked at element-only content, which as the name suggests, you can have things like sequences or choices or any set of elements as an element's children. Uh, in this case here, name can have two, child two children, first followed by last. And that was an example we looked at last week. We also looked at mixed content. As you know, mixed content, same thing. But you can w uh, mix in some PC data there as well. And so that certainly makes sense um, in the con that makes sense, well, you can see that in this type of example, albeit a bit contrived, more compelling, I think, is any instance of, say, XHTML, which by nature has PC data, like the text you want to display on a web page, intermingled with some XHTML markup, thereby representing perfectly this notion of mixed content. And then we looked at empty content, which brings us sort of full circle, makes everything really easy, whereby you can have attributes, but you cannot have children. And that, really, uh, that pretty much rounded out our discussion of complex types, or at least the various different content models. So any questions on what we did the last couple of weeks? Yeah. Oh, this? No? Yeah. I don't know whether you dealt with it, but, but in, in using the sequence, you're, you're um, predetermining the, the actual sequence. If you say for, for name, like first, last, mm -hmm. must have first name, must have last name, in that order. In that order, yep. Can you specify? You can. So how did we, what was the modification of that content model whereby we required all of them, but in any order? So it was the XSD all element. So you replace sequence with the word all, and that means everything that follows has got to be there, but we don't care about the order. But we do care about the numbers of times based on the min occurs, max occurs attributes, whether explicit or implicit. And the other, the third um, type of content, the third type of construct we looked at was not and I'll just repeat myself, not uh, just all or sequence, but that third one, just to be clear, choice, where it affects a sort of conceptual loop where you just get to pluck out one of the following elements on every so-called iteration of that choice loop. But it's not a loop per se, but it's a useful way, perhaps, of thinking about it. Any other questions about schema? OK, so today is about taking a look at, and as well as motivating, this notion of a web service. So there's a bit of technical stuff that I put up front where it pretty much lays the groundwork. But what you should realize going into this um, is that what we're about to see in the form of what's called SOAP and WSDL 
are instances of languages that humans don't really need to write themselves and dare say don't really need to understand themselves because the syntax thereof um, is, the syntax is still XML based, but there's a lot of arcane information in there that's of relevance to software that we will demonstrate today, but less so to humans. So we won't dwell so much on what every single element and attribute means, but try to get an aggregate view of what this file is doing and why it actually gets the job done. And then we'll look specifically at a tool from Apache called Axis, which is a web services toolkit, which in a nutshell takes a description of a, an RPC-based service that someone has published for the world to use and automatically generates code that allows you to hook into it without you having to write the low-level socket code yourself. And for those unfamiliar with some of this jargon, I'll try to elaborate on that as we proceed. But do certainly chime in with any questions. All right, so as far as you know today, what is a web service, if you know it all? It's not a website. Web service has this specific connotation. It's an application on the net. So it's an application or an API that someone has written for the others in the world to use. And they allow you to hook into it generally via HTTP, thereby, um, uh, as the name web service might imply. So Amazon has a web service. If you've read ahead in Project 4, you'll know that one of the components of Project 4 is actually to hook into a real world web service, namely Amazon's, so that you no longer are playing in just E259's little sandbox of projects, but are actually using some of these concepts and tools out in the wild, so to speak, and actually hooking in with Amazon service in addition to our own um, fake Scamazon products. Uh, I think you'll find that Amazon's is, I mean, admittedly a bit cumbersome, it's a bit large, and it's documented, but not to the point of clarity, I would say. So certainly make use of the listserv if you have questions, and do realize that we provided you with some sample code within the project distribution itself, so that you get a sense of how to use this kind of thing, but you don't worry and spend multiple, multiple days um, trying to figure out how to use Amazon service just for the sake of using Amazon service. It's meant to expose you, but not really cause you to bang your head against the wall because it's not the nicest um, API. But there are others out there. I believe a eBay has a comparable web service, so that I might be wrong there, but PayPal very much does. In fact, a project I worked on a couple of years ago was trying to come up with a billing system that I could use for a small startup, the purpose of which was to be able to bill clients on a semi-regular basis. We didn't want to have to take physical cards because this was an entirely online business, so we wanted people to be able to provide their credit card information, click a button, and bam, we would bill them. Well, there's certainly um, big e-commerce providers that you can sign up with. If you Google around, you can see some of the bigger names, because certainly this is a common thing for websites to do today. But for a little operation like we were, we didn't want to pay ridiculous fees. We didn't want to spend thousands of dollars in integration costs or whatever to get some system out of the box. We just wanted to write, as computer scientists, as much of the code ourselves as possible and just hook into some existing system. And I'm sure there are alternatives out there, but the one we ended up going with a couple years ago was PayPal. So PayPal, as you know, is this online bank sort of entity that you can have accounts uh, storing money that you can use to then send people money or receive money via PayPal's website. But if you sign up for one of their uh, merchant accounts, I believe they're still called, by paying maybe $20 a month, $30 a month total, they also provide you with programmatic access to your PayPal account which is to say that you can write some Perl or C++ or Java code, uh, PHP code, that allows you to hook into PayPal service without going to their website. Rather, you can do this at the programming level and do transactions, like send someone money, bill someone's credit card, uh, check your own balance, and these kinds of things. So you can really write your own somewhat low-level code to interface with your bank account, really. And this was precisely what we wanted, and it's hard to beat 20, 30 bucks a month. And granted, they charge transaction fees for every credit card payment, but 2%, 3%, it was a couple of tenths of a percent higher than a typical place, but it was flexible. And so for us, it got the job done. So how did we get this job done? Well, we signed up for a free PayPal developer account, poked around some of their documentation, and they provide the equivalent of a web service, a web-based API that people like us could hook into and interface with our bank account and process credit card payments. And we happened to download a pre-made API that was written in PHP. But the beautiful thing about their having offered this as a web service 
was that it was, for the most part, platform independent. They also had, I think, a Perl library and maybe a C++ and a C Sharp library, even though their backend code was written in who knows what. Didn't really matter because they had pre-generated stubs, so to speak, functions that we could implement, integrate into our own code by way of header files or include files or the equivalent, whatever our language was. And unbeknownst to us, in a sense, those stubs, those functions that they gave us, had all of the underlying TCP IP code that was necessary to create the illusion for us that we were just making local procedure calls. But in reality, those calls were being shipped over the web via port 80 or port 443 for SSL to PayPal server coming back, and then were we getting our answer. And the only way we or our users knew this was happening is because our website was slightly slower than you might like because there was this slight maybe half a second or second delay as this transaction was going across the web, PayPal was doing its thing, and they're not the fastest site out there if you've ever used them, and then we got our response back. But for the most part then, we didn't have to implement any of this stuff any of the banking code, which was really quite nice. And so again, I think this speaks to the potential for these kinds of services. And it does seem inevitable, at least in my opinion, that the world of software is increasingly migrating toward web-based stuff and away from the Microsoft such and such from yesteryear. I mean, Google's tools are sort of case in point. But time will tell. So what's the history behind all this? Well, long story short, there's a long history. Ever since there was XML, there were XML-based RPC mechanisms. For those unfamiliar, RPC stands for what? OK, remote procedure call. So almost everyone's lips here move, so that was a good thing. So that just means it's a function that you execute on your local machine, but it, in actuality, it's actually doing some stuff on some remote server, potentially unbeknownst to you. And this is in contrast to an LPC, local procedure call, which is just a function or method in the sense that we always almost think of it, it's just a local function being executed on our CPU. So there's this tech, uh, technology, if you will, called XML RPC, which I'm actually a big fan of because it was so darn easy uh, to get up and running with. I actually think SOAP is a bit more sophisticated, a bit more cumbersome, more powerful perhaps, but really depends on what your goals are. We'll focus on the latter though today so that at least you get the most exposure possible and then can rein yourself in if you'd like with something a little simpler. Um, and I won't dwell on some of the specifics here, but if you like this kind of history, there are some of the, uh, the steps toward its current version. Um, and the architecture, so this summarizes perhaps with a few bullets uh, uh, what's going on here. And again, the only thing that open tag, closed tag, I think, has really brought to the picture is human readability, is simplicity, is a lack of proprieta um, proprietariness, and in general, just inability for um, many other languages to hook into this underlying mechanism, as opposed to something like CORBA or DCOM or some sort of uh, alternatives from present day and yesteryear that were more so tied to a specific platform like Java or uh, Windows or the like. So what does it take to implement an RPC, just to lay the foundation here? So to execute an RPC, a remote procedure call, you need two pieces of code, stub code and skeleton code, though you can call these things other, uh, other things certainly. The stub code is the function or method that is literally on your local computer that you call like a local procedure call. Skeleton code, or uh, skeletal code, is something that's on the remote server, and it's sort of the counterpart of that stub code. Because each of those guys, unbeknownst to you, happens to implement some TCP IP stuff typically that allows those two guys to talk to one another. So this guy, when you call him, talks to this other guy via the internet, this guy actually does the number crunching or the data retrieval or the deduction from your bank account, returns a reply to this guy over the internet, and it's this guy that then hands back the answer as though it were his own. So at the end of the day, in theory, you, the programmer, don't need to care or know that there's this whole internet in between you and that skeleton code. The catch, of course, is that this notion of an RPC introduces what kind of risk to your system? or to your program? Latency. So latency, case in point, PayPal, not the fastest site. What else? I'm sorry? 
serialization. So there's certainly that trickery. I wouldn't try passing particularly complicated data structures across the wire or large data structures. For instance, you probably don't want to uh, pass a B tree or a fairly large hash table across the wire for someone else to deal with just because the amount of bandwidth it might take, because of the complexity of references, pointers that are pointing from uh, linking parts of that data structure together. There are mechanisms in place with things like SOAP, as we'll see, that handle almost all of that serialization for you, but you can certainly come up with uh, problematic cases that can't be serialized or can't be serialized correctly. So you might have to worry about that. You can't just pass anything across the wire that you want, but you typically want to pass maybe primitives only for simplicity, but that's not a strict requirement. What else is a risk in letting someone else do your work for you? Pointers. I'm sorry? Pointers. So pointers. So same issue with um, the data structures and circularity potentially in dealing with that. So serialization, really? Yeah, so that's the kicker, perhaps, is this potential for failure. It's a rare thing that I can call a function on my local machine, and it's just not going to return. Right? The only way that's generally going to happen is if whoever wrote that function has some kind of bug in it, or an infinite loop, or some other problem goes wrong with my system. But as soon as you start passing your data across the wire and hoping someone else is going to respond to you, you get this potential that your function's just never going to return. The rou router dies in between, that guy hangs or is completely delayed. And so now you can't really just execute your methods, you have to try, borrowing this jargon of try catch blocks, to execute your methods, but be prepared for the potential that you're just not going to get back an answer. And so the thing is going to time out after n seconds or milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So actually, that's another bullet point to toss up there, this notion of security. So the easiest way, perhaps, to, uh, to deal with the security implications of shipping your data across the wire is just to use something like what? So SSL, I mean, if these are web services, they're presumably going over HTTP. Well, you can route them instead over HTTPS and just trust in the security of RSA and these other mechanisms currently being used to implement SSL and the like. Um, but there, too, you're still vulnerable to more uh, arcane man in the middle attacks and other kinds of things, if you're familiar with some of this jargon. So that's certainly an issue as well. You might not want to be doing this with particularly sensitive data if you're paranoid about those issues as well. I mean, reasonable concern, even if you're sending it encrypted. So sure, so all these issues come into play. But what you get in return is convenience, is larger feature, more features that you yourself didn't have to implement. You get access to data that you yourself are not housing. And so it's a trade-off, but perhaps it's a win, depending on the circumstances. So um, here's just a more of a succinct definition of what a stub and a skeleton is. But stub, to summarize, runs on the client. Skeleton runs on the server. And among the demos we'll look at tonight is one in which we generate automatically stub and skeleton code based only on an XML-based description of one of these web services. And therein lies some of the magic. So what is SOAP all about? So much like HTTP and TCP and IP are protocols, standards, so is SOAP just a protocol. So it's XML-based. And the SOAP recommendation, if you read it, simply tells you what must be in a, a SOAP document for it to be a SOAP document. What its root element has to be, what its attributes have to be, what its child elements have to be, the order in which they must appear, all of this stuff with which we're familiar now from talking about DTDs and schema. So it certainly has roots, this thing, and um, some technologies currently in use, perhaps some that you've used yourselves. So fundamentally, we're not introducing some new capability to the world, but rather solving the problem differently. All right, so what is it exactly? Uh, I won't dwell so much on the specifics there, because it's best explained perhaps by example. But it is just a standard that allows you to ship, or that allows you to, um, that allows you to convey procedures, um, method requests, across the wire, with arguments or without arguments, and get back potentially um, return values. So it's the underlying transport mechanism that standardizes how you're sending your ints, your strings, your floats, your data structures across the wire and getting some response back. So what does this look like? Well, I went ahead, and you'll see this in project four. And I think we can demo part of this in a bit with a little dummy implementation here. This is an example of my sniffing um, my web page request when I was using our own project four, when we had gone ahead and implemented it. So you might not recognize most of this stuff, but the very first line seems to indicate that what happened was an HTTP post 
to the URL slash warehouse slash services slash purchasing, which turns out is the URL of Project 4's web service, the so-called purchasing web service, um, that um, is part of the distribution code. So what I did was I pulled up our own implementation of Project 4. I used uh, Firefox, for instance, with that live HTTP headers plugin that we tried a few weeks ago. I clicked Submit to buy Checkout from Scamazon, and bam, this is what went across the wire, ultimately. Um, let me just think for a moment. Actually, a bit of a white lie, so I shouldn't describe it in terms of Firefox, because this is something that's actually happening on the server side, not on the browser side. So I actually misspoke there a moment ago. So you'll recall our picture, perhaps, from Project 4, which looks, I'll skip ahead, but it's to a picture you've seen already, a little something like this, whereby here is Scamazon, and here is that warehouse. And even though for convenience they will be running on the same physical box, we created a conceptual um, distinction between one entity and the other, so that they don't strictly have to run on the same box. So what you're looking at is a sniff of what's going on between Scamazon and the warehouse. So what I actually sniffed was the traffic from Scamazon to the warehouse and then ultimately back, even though I was sniffing on the same box and I didn't have to sniff an entire internet connection. So this is where we're currently looking. And it turns out that when you check out from Scamazon using this SOAP-based approach that we've taken, what Scamazon is sending to the warehouse <laughs> is a little something like this. So it's clearly an XML fragment. We're using post, if only because it's hard to imagine fitting that in a URL. And it would look like a complete mess. So we're using post, but for other reasons as well. Uh, it is, in fact, an XML document. The root element seems to be called soap end for so a uh, rather envelope. We're using a prefix of soap end, which is just defined to be this namespace, which is just something that's um, more than ever, you really don't need to care about since it's a computer that generated this stuff. But here's a body of this so-called SOAP envelope. And now here's something neat. And if you've read most of or all of Project 4, you should recognize process PO is that method that we provide you with that allows you to process a purchase order. Remember, the point of it was to allow you to pass a string representing an XML document that is a purchase order using whatever standard you came up with. And it passes that to this method. You pass it to this method called process PO. But process PO, in turn, does some intercommunication with that web service. Well, how does it communicate with the web service? It posts, quite literally, a message like this. Well, what does it post? Well, the method called process PO is ultimately passing one argument. So here's arg0 of type string. And what is it passing, apparently, when you run this thing out of the box? Yeah, it's just that open bracket, PO slash close bracket, which unfortunately is all we gave you out of the box for the PO element. Recall that one of your challenges is to come up with a standard for this purchase order document. But out of the box, all we send is this, which is completely useless at the end of the day because there's no data embodied, captured in there, like what orders were in your shopping cart. But this ultimately is what's gone across the wire and suggests exactly how this data from Am Scamazon is going to get marshaled across the wire to that foreign web service. Okay, So to be clear, we sniffed essentially the connection between Scamazon and the warehouse. Well, how did the warehouse respond? Well, it turns out, and this is a completely independent story. It could be told any number of ways. But it turns out that our warehouse recall is implemented with a bit of XSLT. Right? To bring that back into the course, we decided to have you write a, a file called PO-ACK, which is the PO Acknowledgement XSL file, whose purpose in life is to be applied to a PO element, namely the one we just saw and received over across the wire, and to process it and return some kind of response, namely an acknowledgment that the purchase order was satisfied, or it was partially satisfied because some items were backordered, or just wasn't satisfied at all. So what is the default response that out of the box, when you guys download this code, the warehouse responds with? Well, he too responds with an envelope, which contains a body, which contains a process PO response, whose value ultimately is of type string as well. And he just returns a PO ACK element, which unfortunately, similarly, is completely empty. But here again is what's going across the wire. So in the past, maybe for project three, if we ever had you apply some XSL to XML, 
where you would just call one local function called apply or transform or whatever, as you've done in the past with projects uh, with project three and uh, yeah, project three and some of our demos around the time of project two, and you would just apply your style sheet to your XML file. Zalin would do its thing on your local box, and it would return to you another string, the resulting XML document. Well, at the end of the day, the same thing's happening. It's just that the warehouse is doing that application of XSLT to XML, and then it's just returning over the internet, or over the local loopback interface, the, its response. So there is this disconnect now between who's doing what. And we're doing it in the sandbox so that you have full unfettered control over everything. But now call Scamazon David's website and call the warehouse paypal.com and you have exactly the same structure that we were using, but albeit with a slightly different API and a slightly different protocol, but still XML based. What's going across the wire? And now, and this is testament to the fact that we won't dwell so much on the specifics of this, this XML stuff is not stuff that you'll need to write. The whole beauty of web services generally is that tools and libraries generate this stuff for you. And that's a, a nice thing indeed. So let's just tease apart some of these things and then dive into a demo or two of how you can actually use both one of our web services and also one from, say, Amazon. So what's this notion of an envelope? Well, as you might guess, an envelope is just a wrapper for one of these SOAP requests or SOAP responses. Um, and it has information about what's going across the wire, what method's being invoked, what the arguments to that method are, and what the return values, if any, are once that method's actually executed on the remote box, like our warehouse. Well, there are some encoding rules that are inherent in any schema that standardize exactly what data types are going across the wire. And as promised, a week and two weeks ago, SOAP uses XML schema. So all those 40 some odd data types that have been available to you in schema are similarly adopted by SOAP as their own. We just saw one of the most simple, namely XSD string, which uh, is certainly representative of the types of primitives you can use, but ints and floats and the like are certainly possible as well. Excuse me. But it is possible to have more complicated objects uh, serialized for you so long as you or the tool that you're using to generate some of the stub and or skeleton code know how to serialize that object. If it's a foo object, you might have to provide a schema that teaches the tool that you're using, the library that you're using, how to serialize a foo object. And what do I mean by serialize? Well, in Java, you have this luxury of just implementing an object however you see fit. Toss some primitives inside of a class as instance variables. Toss uh, some, uh, so toss some instance variables. You can toss some references in there as variables to link various objects together. So in Java, you have this luxury of just coding something up as you might envision it in your mind and having it all stored in RAM. Unfortunately, it's not necessarily as obvious how you move an object in computer A to a, compu um, a RAM in computer B. So because there's this internet between A and B. And to serialize an object means to take its in-memory representation and convert it to the, a string, really, a sequence of bits from start to finish so that this guy can take an object in memory and serialize it into just a sequence of bits that'll go across the wire. And then this other guy can demarshal or deserialize it and can put those bits back into their rote locations in this guy's memory space in his RAM. So, yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which encoding stuff? Oh, so you could, but then you run into some, well, Two reasons, at least. One, you run into namespace issues immediately, because notice that, at least right now, we have process PO return in the <laughs> default namespace. And we're going to get namespace confusion if we just have open bracket PO act close bracket, because it's going to be in what appears to be the uh, default namespace, which actually here is not implied. So the processor got a little lazy and is just assuming that it owns the default namespace. The second thing is that, yes, this is XML going across the wire, but that is, in part, completely coincidental. The fact that it's XML is only because Project 4 has the string that's being passed formatted as XML. 
And that's just because we want to apply XSLT to it. So we could just be sending a string of characters and words, and all of this would look the same. But because we happen to be sending XML, SOAP is, the SOAP toolkit is uh, escaping those characters. So they're simply not conflated with any of the metadata that's shipping that data across the wire. But it's not strictly XML that we would have to send across the wire. So in short, this makes it completely obvious to the processor what is metadata and what is actual data. Because he can always um, decode these entities upon receipt of them again. And in fact, it will. Not necessarily. Not if the data you're shipping across the wire is just a string, like hello world, or a number, like 123, or a floating point value, like 1.23. Could we have slammed, I mean, put C data in there? Uh, C data bracketed. You could, if, but if you were passing a C data section, it too would be escaped, where the open bracket would become a doll, uh, ampersand, LT, semicolon, and so forth. Because SOAP doesn't know, care about what kinds of strings you're sending, but if you do happen to send data that have potentially confusing XML characters, it will escape them, just to avoid any confusion. So for now, perhaps, turn a blind eye to the fact that this is actually XML, because that's fundamentally irrelevant and not a requirement for using SOAP in the first place. It's just the string we are passing to the process PO method per Project Forest documentation happens to be a string of XML. But that's really just a coincidence that the underlying transport mechanism is also an XML. And it's a coincidence insofar as this is an XML class, so we pretty much just do everything in XML. Yeah. Sure, excellent question. So can you have these um, SOAP calls executed in parallel by a client and have multiple uh, responses returned? Absolutely. They won't go through the same connection, in fact. What, they should, and what should happen, if you're familiar with TCP IP, is that each of those connections should get its own source uh, TCP port number. And so the server will be able to, dis the stub code and the skeleton code will be able to distinguish one connection from the other. That is true. But that is true. Oh, absolutely. And th I mean, because these are web services, they're all, they tend to be based on HTTP. And can think of it this way. If you have two people in your home who at the same moment pull up CNN.com and hit enter, those are two identical requests coming even potentially from the same IP address, thanks to your home router. But CNN.com is certainly able to distinguish them one from the other and even give you a different layout based on your cookie preferences because, thanks to TCP. So what's happening is that if this is computer A, the client, and it opens two web pages like CNN or makes two process PO calls, the first one will get a random port number like 1234. The, that guy will connect over to the server on port 80 by default because that's where the web service is likely running. Meanwhile, this guy in parallel or near parallel will open a second TCP IP connection using TCP port 1235, uh, whatever is available, also to port 80. But server B, thanks to his protocol stack, will know which request came from which source port and will therefore treat them differently and respond to each of them over the appropriate socket connection. So there should be no room for confusion. So. Excellent question, but it's handled by the underlying transport mechanism, and the de neither the developer nor even the author of this SOAP stuff even needs to care about that if he's using something like UDP or TCP that have ports associated with them. Yeah? Um, in slide 17, you say that XML schema primitive types are, are sent as is. Okay. Um, 
So if you have an int, you're, you're literally sending just say four bytes over the wire? Correct. Um, does, does the specification also specify endianness? How do you deal with that? Endianness, I believe either it specifies or just assumes network endianness, which I believe is standardized as little endian. It's been a while since I've done my networking classing classes. Is that sound correct? Little endian for network endianness? Oh, it's big endian for networks? Okay. Little endian for Intel. Okay, so big endian for networks. So it will handle that for you. And so long as Stub and Skeleton both know that, which they should, then you're okay. Yeah. Question? Okay. I mean, so it says that you send a, um, an envelope, right? Mm hmm. Uh, in a post, and the envelope is a chunk of XML. Mm hmm. It's an XML document. Correct. Right. So, what is it? I mean, how do you express? I mean, what really goes across the wire is ASCII for character data, right? Correct. Oh, I see. OK, so actually, let me scroll back. So when you invoke methods like process PO or foo that are designed to take an int, you're indeed passing them just a typical four-byte integer, most likely. But indeed, what gets sent across the wire, actually, thanks to the standardization of these types, is an ASCII representation of that four-byte integer. So that four-byte integer, if it's the number 41, is actually going to be converted to the ASCII values for four, quote unquote, and one, quote unquote, thereby using only, say, two bytes total to represent those two characters because the underlying transport mechanism is XML. So it will be converted to strings, to ASCII strings. Not necessarily ASCII. Odds are it'll be something like UTF-8 or 16, so that you can have variable length. But the point is actually, as you note, that yes, it's converted to ASCII. And so numbers and the like are not represented in their binary form, but in textual form. OK, e excellent distinction. Uh, so what is doing? all of this for you. Well, a SOAP router, so to speak, is all it takes to actually route these messages from stub to skeleton. And if you have a SOAP router in replace, uh, what this means is that your web server or your application server is running some kind of module. Think of this like an Apache plugin module that knows how to send and receive SOAP-based messages so that what it can hand back to the software that invoked those methods or process those methods is not the XML and let that guy deal with the parsing of it, but rather hand him back the four byte integer that happened to be sent as UTF-8 across the wire, or the object, or the string, or the decimal, the floating point value, or the like. And so in fact, one of the jars that some of you have been adding for project four to Tomcat's installation and the like is some of this access code. And it gives the, it adds the functionality to Tomcat to support SOAP-based transactions. Because long story short, one of the things you'll find in your configuration files in web.xml, I believe, are a few lines of config code that, tell, that teach Tomcat how to handle any incoming requests that happen to be SOAP messages. And specifically, it tells them to pass control for processing of those requests off to some class in the jar files that you've put in the lib directory for Tomcat. So it's like uh, how you add, for instance, CGI support to an Apache Linux-based web server or something, or a PHP module for the same. Yep, question? Listen on the appropriate port protocol? Listen on. Oh, that's a good question. Listens on the appropriate protocol. No, it, well, it could be. It's been a while, actually, since I wrote that. I can save myself and say that uh, it could be just, you could, in theory, ship these requests over SMTP, for instance, that instead of HTTP. So even though they're called web services, that's more of a convention than an outright requirement that you use HTTP. So the save here is that it could be. Uh, but that's sort of equivalent, so part, somewhat equivalent. So yes, if it's easier to think about that as saying port, that's fine. But you can generalize away from port and say that it's actually the protocol, which is completely port independent, because you can just choose the port number to run it on. For instance, we're running on port 8080 or 65,000, whatever each of you has chosen in server.xml. But yes, it listens on, on the appropriate port for the appropriate protocol. 
All right, so how do you describe these services? And then once we've told this story, how do we actually use them? So let's take a look at this, and then we'll take our break, and then um, take a look at some actual usage of this stuff. So long story short, WSDL, Web Services Description Language, is fairly arcane XML syntax that fortunately can be auto-magically generated for you thanks to some toolkits, one of which we'll look at tonight, that just describes what your web service does. So somewhere in the XML called WSDL is going to be a description of what the method is called that this web server is supporting, uh, what kinds of arguments it takes, and what kinds of return values it has plus some other stuff, what port number to contact to use this web service, and other lower level details like that. So WSDL is usually used with SOAP, whereby if you want to generate stub and skeleton code, you use a toolkit like Access to auto-magically generate some Java code based on the WSDL file, and the auto-magically generated code that's spit out for you to use happens to use SOAP as its underlying transport mechanism say by convention, but you can certainly imagine other things as well. So here's an example of a more fleshed out, uh, or here's an example of WSDL, a few parts of which are labeled. We'll look quickly at some of these, but again, don't worry so much about uh, ever having to write this stuff, but it's useful perhaps to be able to glance at WSDL and get an overall sense of what services are provided. But by far the simpler way to hook into web services is to read the manual or read the example usage, frankly, because it can vary based on toolkit as well. How, what kind of code is generated. So in a WSDL file, you have a whole bunch of definitions, the first couple of which might be the messages that can be passed to and from this web service. So messages like get rate request and get rate response. So what we're looking at here is an example from a popular website called xmethods.net, which is like a directory for publicly available web services for things like stock quotes and weather and babblers and silly things like that that you can, um, uh, that they host WSDL files that you can then use to generate skeleton and stub code so that you can hook into someone else's foreign currency converter program and use it as though it's your own. So this is exactly what this is an example of. So the types of messages inherent in this kind of service are to get a rate, to get a rate and request as much, and then to get a response. And so they happen to be called get rate request, get rate response. Um, port type, so this describes the kinds of operations supported here, so we'll take a look at that in a moment. We'll move, get rid of the dot, 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 and actually look what might be inside there. Um, then there's this description called bindings, an element called bindings, which gives a bit more detail as to how a computer should go about invoking the service. More on that in a moment. And then finally, a description of where this thing is, the host name, the port number, things like that. And we'll tease that apart in just a moment. So what might the message be? Well, this web service, if you read the manual for it on the XMethods website, will tell you that you can invoke a method called get, um, get rate, or some such similar method. And that rate, uh, that method, takes two arguments, country one, comma, country two, both of which are strings and represent the names or codes for a country. Convert US to UK, UK to US. The type of response you'll get is just a floating point value the name of which will be return, and that's just going to be the exchange rate. So for US dollars to pounds, it's like 2 to 1. In the other direction, it's like 1 to 2. So you would get back something like 2.0 or 0.50 or the like. Uh, what's under that port value? Well, this specifies exactly what each operation that's supported takes in and gives out. So it clarifies exactly how this service works. So we, the operation, the method as I called it, called get rate, takes as input one of these get rate request messages, and it spits out one of these get rate response messages. So now we're defining not just the messages that are going to be passed across the wire, but we're specifying who uses those messages, namely a single operation provided by this web service called get rate. So think of this as the Java doc, if you will, of a web service, even though you have to infer it from the XML. So the binding gets a little more arcane um, and talks to us about how this stuff is going to be encoded across the wire. In fact, because this guy is actually a bit similar, um, the input and output is, well, what this is saying is defining exactly how the input's going to be encoding using some default SOAP values and how the output is going to be encoded using some default SOAP values. Because these are, and that is all related to, to be clear, 
that get rate operation. But because these are all somewhat lower level uh, automatically generated details, let me move on to the final one. There's a description of what this means. So the service. So it's in the service, uh, rather, it's in the service element, and in turn, it's poor child that you can infer or see the location of this thing, where on the web it is, and what port it's on. And so we'll glance at that in a moment, actually, because for project four, when you generate WSDL automatically for the purchasing web service, the thing that processes those POs for you ultimately, we'll actually see something like uh, ice2.fas.harvard.edu colon 80, if I happen to be running the, the service on ice2 in FAS's cluster. So we'll see that actually manifest in our own WSDL file. And finally, some types. So this is an example from um, address book WSDL, which I believe, do we have a printout of here? Uh, which isn't included in the printouts, but is in fact included um, in the online source code called addressbook.wisdl, just to give you an example of some custom types. So we said earlier that, you can, you, uh, that SOAP has uh, used XML schema to define the data types that you can pass across the wire, both as inputs and as outputs. Well, they don't have to just be generic strings or the like, but you can actually restrict their values. So the example we just looked at for the currency exchange doesn't make use of this, but this is drawn from another sample, another WSDL file, um, that to demonstrate that you can have this additional element called types that provides within the WSDL file itself a description of some data type, some user-defined data types, completely written in schema, but that can then be used elsewhere in the WSDL to say that, yeah, the input to this method is in fact a string, but it's got to be a string that represents a state, for instance, like Texas or Ohio or the like. <coughs> so just know that that is possible. Yeah? So the simple thing is, WSDL uh, is sort of on the service provider side. Yes. It publishes to the world and says, here are the things that I can do. Mm -hmm. There's a function called that is allowed that we'll input and use out. Correct. And how do we know that the WSDL exists? How do you know? OK, so to summarize for the camera, WSDL is the, the document that describes for the world on a web server what services that web server provides. How do you know it exists? From the user's manual. Or you click the link on Amazon's website to FAQ about Amazon's web services, and they say, for more technical information, here's our WSDL file. Use it as you see fit. Or better yet, a lot of sites like Amazon will pre-generate the code for you even. Like, actually, PayPal does this. I didn't have to generate the code myself. I just downloaded a prefabbed PHP uh, implementation, and they just save people the trouble for the most part. So you only know about the WSDL if someone has told you, and often in the form of a website saying, go here for the WSDL. Yep. And there's also a UDDI which can use the naming service for finding. Yes. So there is. There's a universal uh, data, dis uh, data description. I'm not going to guess. UDDI, directory information. Maybe that's the D and the I in there. So there, are, there is this, this standard called UDDI that's meant to serve as a clearinghouse for WSDL files, whereby if you want to find a web service that provides stock quotes, you could look in a so-called UDDI directory. And they, well, that would provide you with essentially the WSDL file for one such or multiple such services. Um, the xmethods.net site that I mentioned before that you should certainly feel welcome to pull up at home is just a website. It's not a special fancy directory, but it implements the equivalent of that, but for humans who might click and browse to find web services. So we actually used to talk a bit more about UDDI in the course, but it's not terribly well used, perhaps, as much as, say, just SOAP and WSDL themselves are by some. So actually, I don't even think you'll see explicit mention of it, but happy to bring it up anyway. Oh, so good question. Um, what are the security implications of using someone else's code? It is completely a rational concern. So I trusted that PayPal, um, I trusted that the code I downloaded from PayPal was indeed connecting to PayPal, and it was, in fact, putting money in my account. Same deal with Amazon for Project 4. You're going to be trusting that Amazon's not going to be, for instance, publishing on their own site all the requests that you've made for the sake of privacy and the like. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to trust the entity that you're hooking into. So it's just like 
I mean, you're trusting your data to someone else um, in the form of parameters and return values and the like. And so if that's problematic, then web services are not the solution to some problem at hand. Good question, though. Uh, document style. So suffice it to say, there are, is, there are other ways of encoding data within these WSDL files other than the way we've seen it before. But I'll actually skip over that for just a moment for today. Um, what it means effectively is that you can ignore all of this RPC semantic stuff, like what's the input, what's the output, and just say, here's an XML file. Just That's all I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to break things down into individual arguments. So how do you go about using this stuff? So for the most part, you use toolkits. And you use a toolkit, again, like Access, that allows you to automatically generate some code. And you use toolkits to automatically generate your WSDL. So this is the beautiful thing. It goes both ways. Not only can you hook into someone else's web service by generating stub code from their WSDL file, but you yourselves, if you decide, damn, I wrote a really good program. I want to make it available for the whole world to use. And that program is written in, say, Java. You can actually use the same kind of toolkit on your own code to generate the skeletal code. That is to say, I can implement a super fancy calculator, a tax service calculator, that will tell me how much tax is owed on a product of a certain uh, cost uh, in a certain state, whose sales tax, for instance, might vary by state. I think this thing is so good and useful, I'm going to let other people use it. I just implement the class, call it tax service, uh, .java, runs fine on my local machine. I can, with the help of these toolkits, run a few commands, generate special code that I can then dump into an instance of Tomcat, spawn Tomcat, thereby running a web server. And now other people can invoke my class from their own computers. And we'll see after our break just how easy that is. Let me pause there for tape reasons and field questions one on one. We'll take a five minute break for those whose hands is not about to go up. OK. So this is kind of neat because it speaks to just how much you can let someone else do on your behalf when it comes to these toolkits. So this is an example that you can pull up, most likely still at this URL that we copied some of the basic framework for because it's such a nice, simple example. Um, and what we're about to look at is a tax service, as I alluded to a moment ago, because I am so confident uh, that I have created a software product that the world would benefit from that I want to provide the world with the ability, I want to compute people's taxes, sales tax, for them. After all, this is a basic formula that really no one should have to constantly be reinventing this wheel. It's just some simple multiplication. So I'm just going to decree to the world, I am now the canonical calculator for the uh, sales tax on products. Invoke me when you want to ask a question like, what's 0.5% of a dollar in product purchases in Massachusetts, I'll give you back the value. So that's the spirit of this. And there's actually a few different methods just to demonstrate different, um, different names for the, the arguments and different return values and the like. But we'll look at at least one of these, for instance, calculating the total amount due given a subtotal and a tax rate, which is going to be subtotal times one point uh, tax percent. And that gives me back the answer. So what we'll see, though, is that we're going to implement this in Java, I'm just going to whip up a class called tax service that implements this functionality, this very simple multiplication. I'm going to run my access toolkit on it to generate some skeletal code that I'm going to then plug into my web server so that other people can invoke my method remotely. So how do we do this? Well, let's take a look at some Java code first. You'll see that in our examples directory tonight, which you do have printouts of most of, there's first of all a server directory. So in the server directory, you will see a lot of familiar files because I pretty much uh, whipped up this demo by taking Project 4's distribution code, copying it all over to example, uh, examples 11, and then I just started deleting stuff that we just didn't need. So I parted it down to a very simple uh, web app directory for Tomcat. You'll notice that in the conf directory are some familiar files, namely server.xml. In advance of lecture, I went ahead and arbitrarily chose ports uh, 8081 and 8080 for my web server's ports. So hopefully no one else is using those ports on the current system, which is ICE3, as you'll note from my prompt there. All right, what else is in here? Well, we have, uh, looks like a web apps directory. So let's go in there. We have now a few different subdirectories, one of which is called taxes. So what's in here? And in taxes is just... And actually, let me just find one file first here. 
Uh, yep. So let's take a look at just one file here and actually ignore what I'm about to write. So in here is a file called taxservice.java, which I wrote up in advance of class, or I think technically these other folks did. And what you'll notice, even though yeah, it was excerpted from that URL, if you want to check it out online. So this is just a class called tax service. Notice there's no extension. There's no magic here. This is just a class that someone in CS1 could have implemented after they knew a bit of Java. The, this person in CS1 has implemented calc tax rate, which takes a subtotal and a total and determines what the tax rate is that's implied by that. So divide one by the other. Let's scroll down to the other two. As promised, there's a calculate subtotal and then calc total. And this is perhaps the easiest one because this is the one that you have to compute while at the checkout counter, perhaps. The subtotal, how much all your goods cost, times the tax rate, which is like 0 .05, per, uh, 0.05 in Massachusetts. And then you just multiply the subtotal times one plus the tax rate and you get back the total cost that's due. So if you buy something for a buck, you're actually going to owe the cashier a dollar and five cents. So that's all this does. And that's it. This is just a Java class that you could have implemented after a week or so of CS1. So here's the power of web services and the toolkits that support them. What all it takes to expose this program on the World Wide Web via web services is a simple renaming of this file. So I'm going to roll back in time now to the way it was a moment ago. And I'm going to rename taxservice.java to taxservice.js. And if I do an ls, notice I've just renamed it .java web service. Just so that you don't think there's any magic going on, it's still the same file. Syntax highlighting's gone because VI doesn't know what kind of file this is anymore. But it's still the same file. No extending of classes, not nothing. There's no imports even. This is just basic arithmetic in Java. OK, who cares? Well, let's go to our server directory, run Tomcat. No one seems to be on my port, which is a good thing. So I'm going to go ahead now and whip open up my browser. I'm going to go to ice3.fas, harvard.edu, port 8080. And I'm going to go in the root directory for a moment. And you'll see some familiar files, which we just keep providing you with so you can test your own setup, especially if you're on your own box. Access seems to be quite happy. We've put all those jars in to make all of its warnings go away, even though you don't strictly need most of them. Happy End just confirms what version of Xerxes and Zalin Tomcat's configured to use. And then there's some of this um, encoding stuff. We'll ignore that for a moment. But what I'm now going to go to is a directory called, and let me make sure I type it right, taxes ta slash tax service. .jws, so that same file we just looked at and renamed so. And I've already mistyped something. Oh, slash services. Uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, taxes, tax service, did I type it wrong? Let's try this again. No services. I'm tax service. I said taxes, yeah? Ice 3, what's going on? Uh, I just ran this before class to double check. Well, let's try one. Hmm, what am I doing wrong? Taxes? <laughs> Sorry, let me double check something. Web apps, taxes. Oh, tax services. OK, sorry. Oh, that's my fault. I renamed it. That's why. OK, sorry about that. So server, web apps, taxes. Let's rename this thing as it once was, taxservice.js. OK, looks good. I'm going to go back, run Tomcat again. Sorry for the delay. Taxservice.js. OK, that's what we were supposed to say. So I just pulled up a .jws file, which is just a Java file with a different extension. And it looks like the web server has somehow intercepted this request, realized that's a web service, a .jws file. So it's generated automatically some HTML informing me of such. Okay, that in and of itself is pretty useless. But what it means is, quite literally, that there is, in fact, a web service here. And if I click this link, Notice it's a little small, but this is going to take me to the same URL, but it's just going to say taxservice.js question mark wisdle. 
And that is just the default URL that Axis, that toolkit from Apache expects, and that is our SOAP router again, you to use if you want to see the WSDL for that Java web service. I didn't write any WSDL. All I wrote was taxservice.java, or really those other guys did it, that URL. I renamed it. That was my contribution. Now I also installed Axis on my Tomcat instance. But all it takes now is to go to WSDL. And what you'll see is a whole bunch of crazy stuff. That's much like in structure the examples we've been looking at. So it's that SOAP router. Access that we installed inside of Tomcat that intercepted this as a web service because it noticed, whoa, .jws, that's a web service that I should therefore analyze and generate some WSDL for on the fly. And here's all that WSDL. And even though there's a lot of stuff going on here, you should certainly notice some familiar phrases. Calc tax rate, uh, calc subtotal, calc total, and then these uh, appendices like um, um, Appendages like response and request and the like. So all of that basic layout that we discussed, the idea of creating messages and requests and responses, indeed seems to have been completely handled for us. So this now begs the question, what do you do with this? If I, for instance, now set up on my personal web page, I add a link to this URL and say, hello world, if you would like to me to calculate your taxes, Use this web service as described by this WSDL file. How do I, a developer elsewhere on the internet, make use of this? Let me pause for a moment if there's a question before we demonstrate usage. Right now. So every time I hit reload, it's being regenerated. So every time on the fly. Not the most efficient way, but this .jws naming convention is actually the, the quick and dirty way of getting a web service up and running, and therefore it's not the most efficient necessarily. So if you just created another JWS, it would be visible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I could go in and just rename these methods foobar and baz, and this WSDL file would change right away upon reloading. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The JWS, I can't recall, but the JWS file I had a package. Was it part of a package? Would that appear somewhere in the namespace? If it had a package, no, it should not because outsiders should not care that it uses a package. That's purely a local implementation detail. All I care about is the public API from that public class. Good question. OK, so let me go ahead and open a separate window so I can leave Tomcat running. So I'm going to go ahead and log in again. Uh, looks like I'm on the same box, which is good. My examples directory. Now I'm going to go into clients, where we have a prefabbed client whipped up. But let's take a look at what it is. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this edgy directory for a moment. And I'm going to delete the class file. And now here's the state of my world. So now I'm just some random guy on the internet. I'm not very good with math. And so I want someone else to calculate my taxes for me. And I've just heard about, thanks to some website that David has published a web service for me to use that will calculate taxes. Let me just hook into his so I don't have to worry about multiplication. Well, I might write code like the following. This too is excerpted from that URL if you want to ch check it out. But notice, this is just a class. There's no extension, no default handler. There's no magic here. This is just a class you might implement in CS1. But you know from the documentation that Access provides, or David has provided, that in order to use this tax service, you have to invoke two method calls. And if you looked at the documentation for Access, it would tell you what the convention is for the methods you must invoke in order to use a web service whose stub code you generated with Access. So actually, let me roll back for one moment before we continue this story. So assume that I've not even begun this project. But I know that if I want to hook into David's web service, I need to some stub code, because I don't want to write the TCP IP code myself. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to David's website, copy the WSDL files URL, and then I'm going to go ahead and run a command that comes with Axis. So I did have the knowledge to go download Axis, install it on my local machine. And Axis comes with a special program called WSDL to Java. And based on my reading of the documentation, I have to type. It's annoyingly long, but um, let's say uh, java.org.apache.axis. And I don't remember it ever myself, so I'm transcribing it here. WSDL.WSDL to Java is the name of the program that comes with Access. And what it expects as its command line argument is the URL of a WSDL file. 
Okay? If I type this correctly and hit enter, what that should now do for me, you can ignore those warnings for now, what that should do for me is create in the local directory a package. So it looks like the package is called edu. Well, it looks like the package is called edu.harbor. Oh, looks like it's eduharbor.fas. Looks like it's edu.harbor.fas.ice3. Looks like, ha, ah, finally, it's called taxes, what was generated. And finally, oh, tax service underscore JWS. This is the problem when you let a computer generate code for you. Let's go one level deeper. Whew, OK, so there's a lot there. Let me clear the screen. When I do an LS, four files were automatic, automatically generated, if you will. These were generated by this tool called Axis. How it generated it isn't all that interesting. What it looks like isn't all that interesting, so long as I know from, say, Axis's documentation what its conventions are for naming these things, so that I know what class to instantiate and what method to call in order to execute David's tax web service. Let's glance at these files for a moment. We'll just look at all four at once. And you'll notice that this is the kind of code, and again, not really many comments, that were generated automatically based on that WSDL file. So again, just to go through it again, just to convey how much was generated, all that code for you. But it's all that code because it handles all of the TCP IP stuff, all of the error checks and the like. And if there is, in fact, a failure of some sort or just unacceptable latency on the order of seconds or the like, it's all that code that will throw the exception that I, the programmer, should actually be prepared to catch because this is an RPC. So based on my having read up on the documentation earlier, and you can use various switches to not have such ridiculously long packages outputted for you. You don't need all of those subdirectories, but those are the defaults. Now let's look at tax client. So tax client has a main method. And notice I'm a little lazy here just to get the demo up and running. I'm just going to try to do all of this stuff, even though encapsulating everything you do in a try block, not the best style. I know from the documentation of Access that what I should do if I want to invoke David's web service is instantiate a tax service service locator, call it service, and then instant, uh, call get tax service from that service. It's a little cryptic, but it's one of these things. Look at the manual, it tells you the conventions Access is using, and that's it. Now I have access via this reference called port to all of the functionality provided by that web service, namely those three methods for calculating total, subtotal, and tax rate. How do I use them? Well. I'm arbitrarily going to compute the tax percent based on $21 and a, total of, a subtotal of $21 and a total of $23.10. I'm going to arbitrarily compute the total based on $21 and a 10% tax rate. And then I'm going to go backwards and compute the subtotal from a total of $23.10 if the tax uh, rate is 10%. So completely arbitrary mathematical examples, but what it suggests is that all it takes to invoke that remote procedure is port dot method name, port dot method name, port dot method name. So all of the magic is hidden in these two lines of code. Everything else is CS1 kind of coding. Down here, all I'm doing is using print line to print the total, print the subtotal, uh, and print the tax percent. So that's it. Two lines of code now in my application to get the job done and the knowledge to of how to go about generating that stuff. The catch, of course, though, is as you noted earlier, you got to worry about exceptions now. What if something goes wrong? Well, you can just blindly catch any exception and just assume it was the fault of the web service. Or you can look at the documentation and realize Access can throw faults of its own for whatever reason. So I teased apart two possible exceptions, either Access specific or more generic, depending on what might happen under there. But there, too, um, you just need to capture it somehow, lest something go wrong with the RPC. So let's try running this. So I'm on ICE 3. So notice that uh, before class, when I was experimenting with this, I made sure to import the ICE 3 package. And again, with the right switch, we could eliminate that complexity, but figured I'd keep the default settings. Uh, and now I'm importing this class, access fault, because I know this is the type of exception that can be thrown. But that's it. Otherwise, this is not a complicated program by any means. So let's go ahead and compile it. So Java C, tax client. And just for kicks, I'm going to go ahead and kill the server here for a moment. OK, you can ignore this. Access, unfortunately, in its present version is generating what Java 1.5 considers potentially unsafe operations. So it gives you those warnings. 
only because of the automatically generated code, not because of my own per se. Now I have a Java a text client dot class, so I'm going to run Java text client. Hmm. Ignore the warnings, but a fault is not a good thing. Let's try it again. Hmm. Again. So what's going on? Yeah, so it actually would have been a better story had I not just killed the web server and made you remember at least for more than 10 seconds. But yeah, the web server is down, so clearly the RPC can't succeed. Now it's up and running again. Let's try it again. Ah, that's pretty neat. Gets the job done. I got some rounding issues on one of those, but it's good. And you can actually, it's nice that ICE is just slow enough that you can actually feel the latency there. So it's because it's not being executed locally. And well, it is being executed locally, but the local machine doesn't know that. So it's either going out on some network switch or it's going out the Ethernet loopback interface. Either way, you can feel the latency because it's as though this is being executed remotely. And if I really wanted to, I could SSH to like a box at MIT, copy my code over there, leave everything alone, run it, and then it would connect from MIT to Harvard, get my response back, and then display it. So you two could do this at home while running the server on ice. So you can experiment in both directions, assuming you don't have firewalls getting in the way of port 80 on either end. So it's pretty neat. And again, even though this was slightly a long story to tell verbally, the amount of code I wrote was pretty negligible. I implemented the tax service. I implemented a dummy client, added a couple lines of code based on Access's documentation. Bam, done. Now anyone in the world can use this tax service for as long as my web server's actually up and running. That's kind of neat. So that's the, the poor man's approach, if you will, to whipping up a Java web service. Write a web, uh, write a Java program, rename it .jws, and you're pretty much done. Okay, that's not necessarily the only way or perhaps the most conventional way. That's a feature that Axis provides you with. So that is Java specific, um, but you can use tools in other languages to do these same ideas. But let's take a look at Project 4, because remember that Project 4 does have that warehouse stuff going on. So let me kill Tomcat here, navigate not to the taxes directory, but the warehouse directory, and notice a bunch of hopefully familiar directories. So we've got our DTD images, etc., and all of this stuff going on in the warehouse web apps directory. But what else is going on there as well? Well, let's take a look. Uh, let me just double check my notes here. Because also in here, let me find this, uh, warehouse, yep, also in WebINF, you'll notice that there's this classes directory, and it's a little ugly because my prompt is wrapping quite a bit, but you'll, you may recall that in project four, there is a purchasing.java class, which gets deployed in the form of bytecodes, a purchasing.class file to that WebINF directory, somewhere nested in there based on our package name. So that's what we're looking at now, is I just copied over, after running ant on Project 4's distribution code, the purchasing class stuff. And it's in this directory, which if you look at all those web XML files, it just tells Tomcat to look in this directory, long though its path may be, for the implementation of the purchasing class. Notice also that there is a couple levels up a web.xml file, which has got a bunch of stuff going on. But notice that, let's see what we can do here. Scroll down. OK, so serve, access servlet. OK, so here we go. So one, and you'll see in a similar web.xml file in our taxes subdirectory, <coughs> notice that there's this servlet mapping that's been there all this time, which if you remember your web.xml config details, which you don't really have to because we hand you most of it, but if you've started poking around at these things or are inclined to, Notice that what this line of code is doing is it's saying for any file called something.jws, pass control, or rather uh, pass the buck to the servlet called access servlet and let that servlet deal with executing that code. So it's actually this servlet called access servlet that generates that WSDL for us automatically because it's being passed because of this config file, whatever the file requested was. And now notice this line, which we're about to use. Similarly, should any file name in the foe directory called slash services also be passed to this SOAP router, the access servlet, um, for processing? So why is that useful? Well, let's take a look. 
If I go back to my server directory and run Tomcat, now go back to my browser, and don't pull up just taxes, but rather services slash, let's get this right, oh, uh, rather warehouse slash services slash purchasing. Ah, very neat. So similarly, has some, X, uh, some HTML being automatically generated. Remember that the trick with access is generally to say question mark WSDL. And there is the automatically generated WSDL now for my warehouse code. And notice mentions of some familiar phrases, process PO, request, and response. So a lot of details here that you as the developer don't really need to care so much about, but they do follow a somewhat familiar form. And recall that this thing currently doesn't really provide that much functionality, just one method. So this thing's a third as long, really, as the tax service, because it only provides that process PO method. But again, I don't care about any of these details. Right? The point here is to let the computer speak these languages. So I'm just going to copy the URL of this WSDL file. I'm going to go back over to my clients directory, where I am going to uh, go ahead and let me just double check here, make sure I get this right again where I'm going to go ahead and run java.org.apache.axis.wisdle.wisdle to Java again, passing it that URL. Enter. Ignore the warnings. Now I have an edu directory again. Now here's the client that I whipped up. So you don't have this client in Project 4, because Project 4, we actually, in order to simplify and standardize you being on the same machine, we actually implement ourselves the process PO code manually. So lecture today is about actually not making that simplification and just using this thing as though it's an actual web service. So here's some sample code. So purchasing client, again, no magic. All this is is a Java class that I whipped up. It's got a main method. And what does it do? Well, again, following Axis's naming conventions, I instantiate a so-called service from which I get a so-called port. And notice that if I want to use the process PO method provided by Project 4's warehouse, just like before, service, or rather, port dot process PO. Well, what's the argument that we promised process PO expects? It's just a string that happens to be XML. And so there's the XML that I'm passing. So in fact, if you look at Project 4's distribution code, you'll see something very similar to this, except we didn't automatically generate the access code. We actually implemented things more manually. But you'll see something very much like this. And that's it. All this demo apparently does is it just invokes process PO passing in an empty element just for kicks to see what happens. Well, let's see what happens. Let me go ahead and. Make sure that I'm importing the right file. And you'll have to do this as well if you play around at home. Because, because it's a cluster of boxes, just make sure that, depending on where you are, you adjust the uh, package name correctly. Let's save that. Let's go ahead and compile purchasing client.java. OK, again, that's because Axis generates some potentially unsafe code that Java 1.5 doesn't like. Now I have purchasing client.class. Let's go ahead and run this. And that's it. So if you recall the setup for this whole story earlier tonight, where I said I sniffed that HTTP traffic, what I really sniffed was what this client, or more generally, what Project 4 out of the box is doing, that is communicating to the remote service. And so again, you can feel the latency, because there is a network connection going on there, as well as some XML processing. but. That is, in fact, going out conceptually across the wire to the web service that coincidentally is running on the same machine. But again, that's really just for demonstration convenience. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't go shipping complicated data structures across the wire. But what you'll find web services often being used for is for retrieval of data from remote sources. So it's someone like PayPal or Amazon that really hosts the huge database. And you're just making very relatively small queries of them. Give me the books related to computers. Uh, give me my current account balance. Pros bill this username $10. So it's most it's, uh, transactions is a nice way of thinking about it, whether it's financial or just um, small requests for data. But no, you wouldn't want to delegate responsibility, for instance, for sorting a million database records to some remote server, because then you run into the obvious issue of just marshalling, that is, serializing all that data across the wire. And for what 
purpose. You can probably do it faster on your own CPU if uh, bandwidth is an issue anyway. But quite a fair point to make. Yeah? Um, the the um, uh, soap router that generates your wisdom, is, is there an option there to uh, kind of generate uh, document literal? Document literal. That's I've Remind me what this is? Uh, the the uh, uh, encoding that, that, uh, uh, that the soap message is, is sent with. I can see that it's... Uh, As in the encode, like the text encoding, like UTF and the like? Right, right. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. It does. Wisdom to Java has an argument with which you can specify that. So actually, let's see if it's man page or equivalent here, or it's usage. Let's just run it without an argument and see what it says. I was wondering if there was a mid test. <laughs> uh, user halberdgen type mapping. Is it somewhere else, perhaps? Oh, OK. OK. There you go. Oh, thank you. Oh, really? OK. OK, cool. Well, I haven't u even used that switch myself. Other questions? Yeah. How I'm sorry? <coughs> OK. Oh, which, which one? I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Oh, the WSDL toolkit. So when I'm saying things like that, so the command that we've used to generate our stub code is this program called WSDL to Java. So um, if I said WSDL toolkit, I probably meant just this. Um, this uh, so that's all I'm referring to. Right. And there's actually, an, you can pass a switch to this to generate skeleton code, whereby you can actually um, not leave it to the access servlet to figure out how to invoke your code, but rather you can write standalone web server code effectively, skeletal code. Um, and I think in the Project 4 spec, we show you how to do that, but then we say, okay, now that you've done it, don't bother using it, we've got a simpler way. But we give you the usage information, and it involves passing the right switch to this thing. Other questions? Well, the, the suggestion I would make, if you like the idea of this stuff and don't necessarily have a have a uh, use in mind just yet, like I did for PayPal, is at least check out sometime this week xmethods.net, the URL of which is on one or more slides, and just poke around some of the examples they have, some of the WSDL files that they link to, because that's the off-sited source when folks are looking for web services to play with. Certainly not uh, exhaustive, and most of them are just silly little programs that people like you know, this tax service have whipped up, but it's nonetheless um, demonstrative of what kinds of things you can do and what kinds of stuff is out there. So why don't we officially adjourn here, and I'll stick around for questions.